Okay, so I think we are officially starting. That sounds good. So Rafael, if it's okay, I'll do a very brief introduction because we usually do that for our talks and then we'll we'll get going. And Graham, we're gonna be recording when the speakers agree, we'll be recording all of the talks and putting them on the MIT YouTube channel. So I think that will be good. And even though we don't have a high attendance today, I'm sure many people will look at Rafael's talk later when it's on online. Fine. So good morning, thank you for coming. It is wonderful to have Rafael Luna here, who is one of our MIT alums in Australia. He's going to be giving a talk today called Infra Architectural Hybrids, which will share some insights from his fantastic uh, career that he's had in architecture. Rafael, in the bio that he sent through, sounds as if he's had an absolutely uh, fantastic career. He's the co-founder of an architecture firm He's also currently a senior lecturer at the University of Technology, Sydney, where he is the director of the Infra Architecture Lab. He received his Master of Architecture from MIT in 2010, and then he went on to receive a PhD in architecture and has had an incredible career both in academia and working in the world of architecture. I think that's enough. I'm sure Rafael yeah. will tell us more about his incredible background, and thank you so much for agreeing to give the talk today. Yeah, no, thank you so much, Evelyn, for putting this together. I really appreciate it and happy to be connecting through the MIT alum, uh, not only Australia, but I think MIT alum global. So perhaps I'll start with sharing my screen. Ooh, if I can find it, there we go. All right, uh, you can't see. Okay. All right. Uh, so yeah, again, thank you so much for preparing this and giving me the time to talk. Today, I prepared this lecture presentation, let's say, to talk about the work that I've been doing post MIT and a little bit about that formation and how it has driven my practice and research. So it's titled Infra Architectural Hybrids. And I wanted to start kind of introducing myself, uh, let's say grounding myself on the on my background. And perhaps this gives a bit of insight of what led me to focus on this topic. So I'm a, you could say I'm a bit of a global citizen. I was born in El Salvador, but I'm also a citizen of uh, the US and Italy. And I grew up in Latin America eventually moved to Boston in 2004 and started MIT in 2000, well, uh, 2007 when I went to architecture school. So I was in Boston already quite a while, uh, ended up doing architecture school at MIT and stayed in Boston for a bit where I formed my architecture firm Proud with along with my business partner, Dong Wim. Uh, who's a South Korean citizen, and eventually we ended up moving our, our firm uh, to Seoul. But through MIT, I had the chance to visit many cities through different courses that I participated in. I had the chance to go to Berlin, Paris, uh, Shanghai, Tokyo, uh, Bangkok, um, and that was only as a student. Along the way, between Boston and Seoul, I also had the chance to practice in Tokyo and London, uh, Paris. So I had already formed this idea of like a global practice or a global citizen and, and was very engaged in understanding the way that cities are growing. And I was very interested in the infrastructure of, of you know, big cities, how these large capital cities are organized and how do we sustain uh, life in these you know, mega cities like Seoul and Tokyo. Eventually in 2023, I got a post here in Sydney. So that brought me to Australia. I got a post at the University of Technology, Sydney. I had been teaching for the past decade at institutions like RISD and Hanyang University in Seoul. And throughout all of that, in, you know, academia in parallel with practice, I always had that bug of, you know, big cities and, and global cities and, traveling around the world and, and getting to know how people live. So I got fascinated with that topic and I think it became more relevant in the contemporary, you know, 
perhaps in the past, let's say five years, especially with the pandemic, the, the, the pandemic that we had and uh, different agendas that I started noticing around the world. So for example, uh, Seoul took this agenda of becoming a sharing city in 2012, trying to reuse their infrastructure, trying to see what the digital economy could do for making cities more equitable. Uh, so that became quite interesting. Uh, the city of Paris formed this idea of the 15 minute city of trying to have every citizen be within a 15 minute radius of any service and amenity. So this whole talk about, you know, cities becoming equitable, becoming sustainable, it has been agendas that have been pushed in the past 10 years. Uh, City of Barcelona as well with the Super Quadra looking at similar to the 15 minute city of Paris, conceptualizing bigger blocks that could become subunits where you have all these services and amenities, right? So there was already these movements of cities around the world of how can we live together in a, in a better society, more equitable, more sustainable. And then we had these series of black swan events that hit everybody globally, right? It became like a global pandemic and a global effect. Of course, the, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, completely paralyzed global, um, global networks, supply chains, then we got hit again with with the evergreen blocking the Suez Canal, which kind of was already building up with with the Corona, let's say stoppage in the supply chain. So this completely killed supply chains globally. So started noticing these dualities that were happening globally, right? Like agendas that cities were taking to, to be more sustainable, but then all these black swan events that you notice how fragile our infrastructures are, how fragile our ecosystems are, that if something gets disrupted, it, it can become a global effect and it can have uh, serious repercussions. You know, how do we get our resources into our cities? Uh, you started noticing the you know, uh, even cars, you know, the supply of cars got depleted globally because they couldn't get shipped. So you couldn't buy a new car, for example. Uh, not that I'm pursuing an agenda of buying new cars, but I'm just giving an example of how supply chains got disrupted globally. Uh, the LA port, you could see all these ships outside and just docking there and they, can, they couldn't do anything, right? So within the field of architecture and urbanism, I got interested in, in looking at all these conditions of you know, the global world and mega cities and started thinking about supply chains and what could really you know, um, be of interest for the future cities to, to provide equitable solutions for everybody. Through our practice, Proud, along with my business partner, Dil Wim, we edited this issue of AD Magazine called Production Urbanism, where we started looking at what, what would allow for industry to be more localized. How can we create micro supply chains? How can we produce, um, let's say, new jobs or new industries within cities as a solution for all these Black Swan events and, and uh, ideas of uh, more localized globalism, if you could think of it that way. So at the time I was living in Seoul and our office is based in Seoul. So we started looking at the local condition that Seoul can offer as a mega city, a city of 20 million people and the diversity that it has. Neighborhoods like Songsu, which is a semi-industrial neighborhood already has the capacity of having housing, industry, commerce, entertainment, everything all in one. So all these agendas that we were hearing about you know the 15 minute city in Paris or the super quadra in Barcelona this is already happening this you know this is a a real life condition that's happening in Seoul as I mentioned we started focusing on Songsu which is one of the few semi-industrial areas in Seoul you can see this is the Sony map of Seoul and the and the gray area is where you can have industry so Songsu is right here if you see my cursor so it's still pretty central and if you look at the zoning of the different buildings or the function of the different buildings, you see that it's very mixed, right? It's not just residential. There's no breakage of this is just for housing. This is just for commerce. It's all mixed, right? We started looking at the composition of the different blocks and how everything is mixed, not just, all, not just in the floor plan, but mixed as a three-dimensional composition. 
and started thinking, what are the tools that we can have in the built environment that allow for this flexibility? And we started noticing these very odd buildings. These are very generic buildings. The buildings themselves are not exciting. They're not, you know, architectural jewels in any, in any sense of the word, word. It's just very generic buildings. But you started seeing all these adaptations, like these vents that were sticking out of windows all over the place. And we started thinking, you know, this is very interesting because it's not the building that's making this adaptable use, but it's all these different attachments that have nothing to do with architecture, even though that's our profession. These are all borrowed from other industries and they get attached to buildings to allow for factories to work inside of buildings. We started seeing little odd compositions like this one where you have double doors opening to nowhere on the second and third floor. But in reality, these were adaptations that the owner had made so that you can bring in materials into the building. So they have these cranes and then you just open the doors and then you bring you know whatever material you need. So these adaptations allow for all these buildings, which are, again, not exciting at all, to become urban factories, to become centers of production within the urban fabric. So you could have housing next to this paper factory, for example. So we started looking at all these different little accessories and thinking of them as productive elements, productive accessories, productive borrowed conditions from other fields that within architecture, there are theories about you know elements and accessories and they can be very theoretical and we read about them in school and, and you, you, know, you place yourself within that history and theory, but in the reality of what soul, you see them as, you know, there's these spatial elements that allow you to have extra space and it allows for extra storage, extra machinery, and it's not, uh, let's not say illegal. It's not, it's in the borderline between illegal or legal, uh, but it's all over the place. You see these attachments that allow the building to expand in a very flexible manner. So we started diagramming all these compositions and seeing, you know, how you can have little micro shops or little extensions, uh, effects of ornamentation where not for the purpose of beautifying the building, but more in terms of how do you quickly change what you do with the building? So we started seeing all these series of fake facades as well as accessories. Uh, you know, entire buildings could be made out of brick, but then you have these fake facades that were placed on top of the building and a tenant can change every six months and they will just change the facade and it will be like a whole new, um, you know, a whole new streetscape. We started seeing uh, semiotic elements, which means, you know, the idea of symbolism and sign on buildings, where the entire building just becomes a, a collection of signs and the whole facade gets clustered with signs that allow you to understand what's happening inside. So that becomes the image of the building. That becomes the image that you see on the, on the street. And signs, for example, like this one, this is a church turret that basically if you want to have a church, you just place that on top of the building and then that becomes a church. But you can see that they also have, um, you know, like a restaurant over here and an academy for math over here. So it's still a very mixed building, but just by putting these signs, you can change the whole operation of what the building can be. We started seeing all these performative conditions, as I mentioned, vents that allow for machines to exist inside of buildings, and then they vent them out. So we built up this taxonomy of very exciting, different uh, non-architectural elements that were being attached to all these buildings. And we started seeing the, the idea that buildings can be these Frankenstein um, compositions made of different parts that allow for the idea, again, of the 15-minute city, services and amenities, mix of programs to happen within one singular building. So even though this might be the conception that you can imagine of a, you know one clean building, the reality is that once you have the occupants, they come in and they adapt it with whatever they want in order to make the building 
perform to its maximum output, right? So here you can have restaurants and shops and factories and housing all in one. So again, the idea of, of planning a 15 minute city, perhaps it's not so clinical in the sense of, oh, let's design buildings like this, because at the end, it's more about the, all these attachments that make the, the, the neighborhood quite lively and adaptable and malleable within a short time period. So this led me to start thinking of, if we can start thinking of architecture in these sort of attachments or accessories, can we focus on accessories that are productive for the purpose of managing resources? And this is what led me to start focusing on what I call infra architecture, which eventually brought me to, to Sydney. And I'm working on the infra architecture lab, which is not necessarily associated to UTS, it's my own private research lab. Uh, but the idea is to pair up with academia and start thinking more critically about what could be, you know, new technologies for energy production, sorry, for, for resource production and management so that you can have buildings producing food, energy, clean air, water, uh, biodiversity, you know, all these resources that we need in order to live in very dense environments, to live in big cities, to make cities more sustainable, more equitable. And this is the, let's say the research that I've been leading for the past, um, you know, well, actually quite recent. For, for the past year, I've been leading this this research quite focused in the infrastructure lab. So I'm gonna show just a couple of the projects that I'm, I'm working on. Uh, some are just conceptual and some are actually being paired up with industry partners so that we can see, you know, the practicality of them and, and see how we can bring them into market or see them in the real world. So for example, this one is a just conceptual prototype of a wind farm house where we can take the accessory of a wind turbine and make that become the shell of a, right? So using this new technology that's coming out of, out of uh, France, they are patenting this micro wind turbine that's made out of, um, well, plastic, but it's, 1.05 meters tall, so it's quite short. It's very quiet, which means that it can be integrated into the built environment a lot more efficiently than the traditional wind turbines. And if it can be minimized in this manner, then you could potentially do something with its structure to create a building. Right now it's being marketed as this uh, wind tree. So it already has this steel structure that branches out and holds the wind turbines. And then you can have them in parks, for example, or something like that to generate energy. So I thought I found that that could be quite an interesting topic of, or, or just the premise of how we can take this and form it into architecture, how we can start building buildings out of the structure that's already there. If the wind tree already has the steel structure, perhaps the steel, although they're conceptualizing as a tree, perhaps it could become a mangrove, like some other type of concept of vegetation. And the structure itself can create a shell, right? So in that case, you can perform or have this building be a generator of energy with maximum capacity. So this one is something that I pitched here at UTS to, to collaborate with a uh, fluid dynamics engineer and a uh, computer scientist that specializes in topological optimization to see how we can produce you know, any form and maximize it with wind turbines to produce the maximum output of energy. So it doesn't matter if it's, it, it's no longer about just having maximum energy for one house or, or just supplying for one house, but could these buildings just generate maximum output of energy and supply energy to the precinct? So it becomes a spillage over of energy to the neighborhood. So in that sense, the building itself becomes an infrastructure of energy. So it's no longer about just housing people, but also how do you maintain the city? This one, it's another conceptual prototype. It's about food production. 
In this case, looking at the element of uh, can you have urban agriculture in these pixelated boxes where you can grow your own herbs and veggies and things like that. But then could that become a vertical system that then becomes a structural system or a building system where you can have a vertical garden and then it can become a neighborhood or community a vertical garden where you could have uh, access, you know, uh, open access to anybody and have public programs for production as well as consumption and education, have a market of the fresh fresh veggies that you grow there. So somehow build, a, you know, these um, injections into different neighborhoods of fresh food production. Uh, perhaps it's not going to produce, you know, the whole idea is not that it produces enough food for everybody. It's more about the educational element of having that piece of building be in your neighborhood to show that you can grow food in your neighborhood and start educating people about uh, fresh consumption of food and, and yeah, and the whole health condition about eating healthy and and growing your own food or knowing where the food comes from. Another one, uh, this one's also in, in prototype, that has to do with all the changing demographics that I've been looking at in mega cities. So for example, in cities like Seoul, that in by the year 2045, 40% of the population is gonna be single and um, the majority of it, 40 something percent of it is gonna be above the age of 65. So you're gonna have a condition where the majority of people live in a single society and semi-retired society. So you lose a lot of the productive uh, population and then you have a population that can still be productive, but uh, yeah, living in a single society where perhaps there's not much aid. So looking at multi-generational housing and looking at how housing can change its typology is also quite important. And I started looking at you know, perhaps if everybody's going to be single at that point, then thinking about three bedroom apartments, it's no longer viable for developers. Uh, perhaps we should start looking at models of uh, studio units that allow for flexibility, but allow for also multi-generational living or shared living or shared co-living and, and co-practicing within the same building. So allowing for flexibility of a uh, structure that you can have single living and at the same time allow for expansion and allow for flexibility of open spaces where you can have, I call them X spaces where you can have anything. It could be shared co-living. So that space could become a shared, let's say living room kitchen, but it could also be co-working, right? You could have spaces of production where, where single citizens can mingle to produce something. You could have micro factories, micro shops, micro workstations. It can be IT as well. So that's a uh, clean digital industry. You don't need much for that either. Uh, it can also just be shared, you know, greenery or shared common space. So with that in mind, if you have the idea of pixelating single living with co-producting spaces, you could play with those spaces to produce new ways of connections. Uh, just with a few simple elements, you can have a very rigid, uh, pragmatic uh, structure, have the ability to produce this three-dimensional vertical city where single people can commingle and co-produce. Okay, and lastly, I'm gonna show uh, two projects that I'm working with uh, industry partners. And these are perhaps more serious in their production rather than just uh, prototypical concepts. The first one is called Wild Futures where I'm exploring the interrelation between architecture and pollinator networks. And the idea is to try to reestablish pollinator networks within urban environments. So the EU has a pollinator initiative, it's, it's called the EU Pollinator Initiative, where they're looking at the crisis that we're having globally of the depletion of pollinators like bees, for example, bees are dying year over year. And this is, I mean, there's many causes, but one of them is urban expansion. We are depleting their, their natural habitat. 
So is there a way of somehow hybridizing their natural habitat as um, the parameters of how architecture can be built and then implemented in an urban environment so that we can reestablish these pollinator networks? So working along with a scientist here at UTS, uh, Dr. Yvonne Davila, and structural engineers out of Melbourne that specialize in timber prefabrication. I'm working on a prefab timber system that allows to connect uh, or produce these three-dimensional ecosystems for pollinators. So the project right now is being sponsored by a couple of, of industry leaders, like the, actually the Urban Bee Lab is in Boston, uh, but I'm also speaking to the Billion Bee Foundation here in, in Sydney. Uh, Sika Australia, which gives the the glue, the bonding, CHH wood products, which donates plywood. Uh, Cromlin gives us the the timber sealant, and yeah, we're working with with a fabrication lab here at UTS, structure engineers. And the idea is that you can just prefabricate these very simple elements and build an entire structure out of just these things. So it's a planter box that works like a beam box and you can infill with soil and it has an irrigation system. And these timber B hotel I beams. And the idea is that um, solitary bees can also nest and, and uh, rest in these. By stacking them, you have a vertical composition where water can trickle down from the top all the way to the bottom and you can start building up these ecosystems so with the scientists i'm working specifically on selecting what are the native species for australia for the location where i'm, I'm building this prototype so everything has to be very specific with the with the native species native species of flora and fauna to form the parameters of for example even the dimension of the diameter of the of the holes it cannot be just ornamental. It has to be performative, right? So for the bees to come in and, and nest or, or uh, just rest in there, everything has to be scientifically uh, analyzed in that sense based on the parameters of the bees. The whole idea is that it should form an ecosystem of pollinators, not just bees, but uh, birds, insects, uh, rodents, you know, any other animal that actually pollinates in an urban environment. So the selection of, of species is quite important. Right now, we are prototyping here in the in, at UTS in the Fab Lab. This is just a visualization of what it looks like because it still has to function as a proper home. Uh, this one was modeled as a three bedroom, two bathroom house, and it's entirely built out of plywood. So it also speaks about decarbonization, the use of less materials, the idea of greening the city, uh, it addresses the housing crisis, which is happening globally, but especially here in Sydney, where you know the rising price of 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 living is having an impact on homelessness and and being able on affordability of housing, right? So if the entire house can be prefabricated with just plywood, then the cost of construction minimizes, and it's still again it can still work as a very proper home. These are the the most up-to-date elements that we're using. And these are the prefabricated uh, modules. Right now we're gonna build a th three meter by five meter by 2.5 meter room out of these uh, modules. So this was just a prototype of you know the elements, but now we're prototyping an entire micro house, if you can say that way, right? So the entire micro house you could build it in like, you know, just a couple of days with $15,000. So by minimizing the elements, prefabricating, making it all of plywood, you can really have this vibrant ecosystem in a very affordable manner and start addressing housing as well as all these pollinator networks. The last one is the, it's called a planter house, which also addresses affordability and greening in the city, but it has to do with water harvesting and urban agriculture for um, also single living. These are 40 square meter uh, prototype single house. 
and it's all 3D printed in concrete with a new uh, mixture of cement that uses less material. So I'm working here with uh, Crystal Homes as the, as the industry partner to produce the idea of these mega planters that when put together, they can form a home, but conceptually they're all individual planters that are just 3D printed with concrete. Let me show you. It's better just to go to the big screen here. So inside it has these water harvesting uh, tanks that you can reuse by connecting within the irrigation, well, within the water system, the plumbing system, so that you can irrigate planting on top. The soil is also meant to be used as insulation because they're so thick. So also using organic materials for insulation. Oh, it goes into some ad. Oh. Okay. So yeah, the idea is that 3D printing the, the mega planters allows you to produce different forms for each planter. And when you put them together as a composition, they actually have a different volume depending on where you are around the house so when you put them together it can form different alleys di different spaces different collective spaces it can shade the alleyways as well as producing different types of collective spaces so you're minimizing the use of materials maximizing its output by having them be prefabricated and still allows for variability and um diversity of space and that's it so this is my lab where um yeah I'm, I'm putting all these ideas together you free to check it out and that's it for me thank you thank you Raphael. that was really interesting i've got a couple of questions and then we'll open it up i'm sure others may have some questions too have you looked in your work, I'm sure you have, how some of what you're looking at could address these urban heat islands that we get? I was reading an article here in Brisbane that the temperature's going up, of course, because of climate change, but it's yeah. not equal in the city. Some neighborhoods are better than others, often because they've got more green space incorporated into them. Mm. Uh, so you're asking just, about the heat Just to extend on that, yeah, yeah. it tends to be the wealthier so, neighborhoods that have more space, that have more parks, that kind of thing. So it's sort of unequally distributed, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so the idea, I mean, the overarching goal is just to look at how architecture can produce and manage resources as you know the general agenda. Mm -hmm. Because all these cities are moving towards agendas of sustainability, equitable inclusion, uh, living. So for example, Sydney has the green agenda or greening agenda uh, because of the heat island effect as well. So you have... Um, I'm not sure if you know Central, actually it's right outside of my window here, uh, Central Park, which is a, a, once or twice. It's a, it's a high rise that has a green wall mm -hmm. uh, along the whole perimeter of the building. So there's this idea of, you know, let's just bring more green into the city. Uh, some of the claims that I'm trying to make is that it's, you know, sometimes the solutions seem too simple, like, okay, let's just put plants. But when you start working in collaboration with, uh, in this case, for, for example, with the scientists specialized in pollinator networks, you can start seeing how the building can produce a lot more if you go into the specifics of the whole ecosystem or looking at resources in general, rather than just saying, let's just add green, right? So- How can we make more green, practice with the green, not just have the green there for the- Yeah, yeah, yeah. so like, I think having green or ideas of incorporating green can lead to multiple resources. So you can do water harvesting, which you can recycle to 
keep on watering the greens and ma minimize the use of water. Mm -hmm. You can, of course, address the heat island effect, um, but you can also address the dying pollinator networks, which are essential for food production. So mm -hmm. a lot of these bee foundations, you know, they're they're focusing on rebuilding ecologies of bees, but they all happening in, in rural environments and in urban environments, perhaps you just get like a beehive here and there, mm -hmm. but it becomes like a localized solution. So by tackling one problem, you can tackle multiple resources, I think. So the, the, the heat island is something that's been, I think from even the 90s, you you started hearing about heat island effect in L.A. and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, big urban cities that that had a lack of green. Um, so, yeah, looking at architecture from a different point of view of, of resource making, I think it's something that can help optimize all these different agendas and different problems that we're seeing. Mm -hmm. And then... Yeah. One more question that I'll hand over. So for the bee house, which sounds really interesting, how, how do you look at things like maintenance and social uptake? Because I mean, looking at that house, I'm like, oh, that's really cool. But you know, I really like a window, not just seeing plants. And I, I wonder it, you know, how long is that pipe going to last before I have to replace it? And what's that going to cost? So yeah, I know yeah, you're yeah. early days, but have you started thinking about those sorts of things? No, yeah, yeah. So that, I mean, the house, works as a house it still has windows and okay. actual proper you know frame windows uh -huh. even though the majority of what you see is is plants the idea is that you're using plants as a wall so there are still sections where you have a actual window and mm -hmm. you're or i'm conceptualizing the green as material as as a bio material Right. So instead of building more wall, you build that privacy through greening. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, you still have windows for air circulation and light and, you know. And hopefully not letting all bees into your house. Yeah, <laughs> that's no. I was of. And, and, that, and that's also one of the other things that working with the scientists, um, the agenda in that one is restoring pollinator networks. And everybody's like, okay, but bees, you know could potentially be dangerous if they sting you or they form hives. And what if there's somebody that's allergic to bees and or these things? Or wasps move in or I don't know. There's yeah. things you can think about, yeah. <laughs> so that's when it became quite technical that originally I started thinking of it conceptually from an architectural point of view. It's like, oh, it could be cool if you put plants and whatever, right? And then once I started collaborating with the scientists, it becomes like you need this specific plant because this specific plant attracts the the Australian blue banded bee or something, right? So by targeting, we were targeting solitary bees, which are non or, or stingless the, bees. Yeah, the solitary native bees, yeah, they're not very, they're yeah. not really dangerous. Yeah. So we were targeting solitary bees. So she gave me a whole list of, these are the plants that you have to get. And uh, soil, like the type of soil dictates the type of plants, which dictates the type of species. So it became very technical in that sense. And because they're native species, what we're working with is making it a vertical irrigation system that when it rains, the water just trickles down. So it's easy for the homeowner to not have to worry yeah. about it. Yeah, I mean, that, that would be the aim to make it just like, actually you shouldn't even worry about the plant. You shouldn't even have to manage them. Yeah. You, should, you should just let them be. Uh, that's something that working here, like I actually have the plants right in the courtyard outside oh, I'm waiting cool. I'm, I'm building the, the pavilion next week so I have the plants ready and originally they were dying because I was like watering them all day and actually taking extra care much. <laughs> yeah and then uh yeah I talked to the the people in landscape and they're like ah no just leave them alone they're native species right yeah. they, they get their their amount of sun as needed and rain as needed and you just let them be so it's become quite a learning curve for me as a, yeah, I'm, I'm not a botanist or biologist or um, all these things, but it's quite exciting to see what the collaboration with the specific scientists has on the impact on architecture, um, because we don't see that in architecture. And I think that's something that can help if we're yeah. going to be talking about production and management of resources, then we need to learn about the resources rather than just... Yeah. Yeah. And um I'm I'm gonna 
guess uh, Green has his hand his hand up. Yes, but Graham, about, I think has a question. About so water, I'm, I'm wondering if it's going to be about water harvesting or or something <laughs> very technical, which I still don't know. But yeah, Green. Uh, no, no, Graham. it's not a it's not a highly technical question. I'm well, it probably has elements of it, but I'm very interested in optimization. I was involved in a startup company. Well, it went for about 20 years. We sold out eventually to Suez, one of the biggest water companies in the world. And we were looking at water supply and sewage networks and reuse networks and the optimization of these. And we found using some of these biologically inspired optimization techniques, we could save 20, 25% of the typical cost of these systems. Mm. Um, I'm also, I've got an interest because my master's degree many years ago, the University of Melbourne, I was looking at the optimization of built forms and how you organize uh, rooms in university buildings, particularly for new um, buildings and so on. So I'm just, I wanted to ask you about, uh, you did mention optimization in relation to the first, um, the energy generating mm -hmm. house. Yeah. And I'm just wondering about op opportunities for use of optimization in this area. And incidentally, I, I should have said, I should have prefaced this with saying a really nice presentation, enjoyed it very much, very interesting. Uh, thank you, thank you. Um, but is there <laughs> scope for optimization in some of these structures? And of course, if you're going to apply it, you have to identify what you're trying to optimize. So you have to really try to identify objectives and probably for the energy house, you know, maximizing energy output is easy, but for some of the others, it might be difficult. But do you see scope mm. for the application of optimization in in this area? Yeah, no, I mean, especially for the energy one, again, a lot of these come first as a concept, as an architectural concept that I have no idea, you know, the, the technical aspect of it. I just see the technology and see the opportunity, like, okay, what if we bring it in? So that one, I uh, that's when I started looking at the collaboration with a fluid dynamics engineer and a computer scientist for for studying the topologies for this very purpose. Like perhaps we can build a pipeline of research for generating software that can give you a sense of how to optimize. Depending on the form of the building, you could optimize where to place. Uh, wind turbines, and then depending on the type of wind turbine, that would also get affected. Um, you know, it would it would give you an idea of how far from each other you could put it to densify the building with wind turbines. But yeah, again, if if one kind of kills the wind of the next one, then it doesn't really work. So that's when when we started looking at that. Um, I applied for a grant, but I unfortunately didn't get it, so I didn't go into into that, um, you know, detail of optimizing, but I, yeah, certainly thought that that's where it would go. Like if you start looking at, perhaps that should be the first step. If we have the algorithm that can help us think about how to optimize the element, then we can start talking about buildings or architectural reform or something like that. Like figure out the optimization first, and then we can play with that. I thought maybe a water planting house, there might be opportunities there for some optimization too in the, the design of those elements and how you group them. Yeah. But, but also retrofitting the early pictures um, you showed of Seoul with pipes coming out and um, various improvisations there, that there could be some scope for optimization in terms of retrofitting buildings for specific purposes. But yeah, anyway. Yeah, no, no. I mean, that, that was one of the claims that um, in Seoul specifically, the user has the freedom to do whatever they want with the space. And that's why you end up seeing these changes, right? That they'll, well, I want to put a factory here and then they'll put a vent out the window. And one of the questions that came out was, okay, if, if we think of it from the point of view of a profession of, let's say, architecture or optimizing, perhaps it loses some of that dynamic. Like when you walk down the streets of Seoul and you see all of this stuff happening, perhaps that's what makes it exciting. And then once you start thinking, okay, how do we do it as an 
from an engineering system or as a designer or you know something that's organized in that way, then it kind of loses that dynamic. It becomes regulated. It becomes about zoning. It becomes about something else that uh, kind of kills the whole dynamic. Right. So yeah, I, I don't know. It's 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 still up in the air. It's still a question. Like, how do we deal with that? Because we see the you know, as I mentioned, there's these realities of agendas, like the city of Paris saying, we want to be a 15 minute city. And we see a real life solution. Like in Seoul, you have a 15 minute city. I, I My office was around um, a factory and around homes and around restaurants and around, you know, you could live, work, entertain everything there. But the regulation is way different. And the dynamics are way different. And once you start kind of killing that dynamic, I think you lose that 15 minute city mm -hmm. capability. The solution has to be different in different cities and different parts yeah. of the world. Yeah, I mean, I always compare back to Boston and uh, I don't know if you remember or not, but <laughs> Wasn't too I, would long always, <laughs> I, would, I, would, I would always say that it's a very aesthetic. Uh, yeah. yeah, sorry. Um, it's a very clinical look that they want to have about preservation. So you would never have pipes coming out of a window, for example, right? Um, but then it becomes sterile in that way. Mm -hmm. It's not as exciting as being in Tokyo because nothing changes. You cannot touch it. You cannot. Um, yeah. It's more static. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's more static. So I think it's a give or take. I mean, it, it's very different in every city and the yeah. agendas that every city has. To me, this seems really exciting to achieve not just environmental sustainable development goals, but some of the social ones as well, which I always struggle with a bit because, you know, if you improve people's quality of life, you know, they use more resources. And if everybody lives the way, say, you know, the average American, the average Australian does, we need multiple planets. And so this seems essential that we have some of these things incorporated. Oh, sorry. Can you still hear me? Yep. Okay. It just got frozen for a second. I think so was frozen. I was just thinking um, oh. that, you know, the idea of having micro businesses that also contribute to sustainability goals is really great, um, depending on the population and where you are in the city. Because a lot of times, I, I work a lot in Brazil, and one of the things that we work on, for example, is agroforestry, where you try and replant a forest but you leave spaces within the forest so that you can still grow coffee or the land can still be productive. So you can get the community on board with replanting the forest because you're incorporating them into that economic activity that you're including as part of the forest. So it would of course be better to have the forest restored completely to what it was, but in the absence right. of being able to do that, you at least have some productivity. And I wonder if some of this is a way to bring that, you know, from the rural areas and actually bring that right into the cities, which is exciting. Right. Uh, give me one minute just to me to change room, but no worries. Yeah, be right. Sorry about that. Oh, it's our fault too. We've with the link and the timing. I think what I'll probably do in the future is maybe the day before I'll email the Zoom link to everybody who's registered, or we'll, we'll get someone to do that. Just <laughs> I mean, this is part of the interactive presentation. It's <laughs> <laughs> getting to see here. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's all part of the of the gimmick. All right. Yep. All set. I was just saying it's you know it's exciting to think about how to contribute to improving people's lives and you know empowering them, but also doing it in a sustainable way. Yeah. No, and it's and it's tricky because of all the different regulations and politics of every specific space. Mm -hmm. there's always some politicized agenda, so. Yeah. Actually, there's an interesting contrast there, Raphael. You were talking about the, um, I'm not sure that quite of the term, chaos is not the term, but the creativity associated with the um, refurbishment and rehabilitation of some of those buildings in Seoul, which, as you said, you know, it couldn't happen in, Australian cities because it'd be yeah. they'd be governed so much by regulation, um, and I mean some of your buildings are well. I like the the concrete ones with the 
gardens and water reuse. But I mean, to be honest, they look very sterile. You need to have a few pipes poking out of them <laughs> and a few other elements. Um, right. But, but I mean, I'm sure architects can make them look good. But, um, you know, there's an interesting contrast there, isn't there? And there's also these conflicting objectives in cities. Like, you know, Adelaide has a plan for greening. They want more green space. But they also have a plan for urban renewal. And there's a lot of uh, renewal in the city where old houses are knocked down and replaced with two smaller houses yeah. and a loss of green space. You know, it, right. it, it's hard to achieve both. We're just getting more and more um, yeah, no. it's, I, areas. So that's why I, I like the term of uh, hybrids or hybridity or the process of hybridity because you cannot solve everything with one component, you need multiple components to address all these multiple agendas. Like you cannot solve housing and greening and um, some other, you know, energy production and all these things if everything is separated and localized and segregated. So I like the idea of, of hybridity and what you could produce with it. Yeah. Great, thank you so yeah. much. Rafael Graham, do you have any more questions? Any more questions, Graham? Uh, I'm, I'm, I had a few that came, but uh, they've kind of uh, gone. But no, look, <laughs> that's a really interesting presentation. And um, I, I'm just wondering, with you've got some very nice graphics there. Um, are you into 3D printing of any of these models of these houses that you're Developing. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I met an architect in New Zealand a couple of years ago, and uh, well, it's actually before COVID, so it's five years ago. But he was all his designs were he three D print rather than well, he produced plans eventually. But it was great to see the three D images of these things. Are you doing that sort of work? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm, um, I'm actually three D printing the three D print house model. <laughs> So, Smaller version. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, like, let's say the three D print concrete house. I'm three D printing it. Uh, yeah, the scale model so that we can test yeah. out and see different things. Um, but yeah, the use of three D printing is quite helpful for rapid prototyping. Uh, so we can see, like, you know, just some fast, quick elements, and of course, it's much smaller. But yeah, it's it's become quite useful. Great. Great. Thank you. Thanks very much, Raphael. This was a great talk. We will put it on to the YouTube channel so that some other people who couldn't attend today yeah. can see it. And hopefully we can encourage a few more alums to come to the next talk yeah. and try to get some momentum. But hope to see you at the next talk in April. The next one. Perfect. Okay. Thank you so much. Good day, everyone. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. -bye. Thank you.